Thank you very much. Uh, next up is the uh, president and CEO of Leading Age. Regents Yokes is a proud member and supporter of uh, this organization. And we've asked uh, Steve Ballmer to join us this morning and talk a little bit about the history, the mission of Leading Age, uh, and uh, then to give us a legislative update. So let's give a big Regents Yokes welcome. Steve, we're delighted to have you. Thank you very much. Can, can you all hear me okay? Is that close enough? Yes. A little higher? Okay, and you're comfortable with my mask being on? All right. Great. I, listen, this is the first visit I've made, uh, one of the first visits I've made in a year. So uh, even though we've been talking about the rules for 12 months, I haven't had to follow them the way you had to follow them. So thank you, uh, Brant, for having me today. That's okay, that volume? Okay. Thanks for having me. I appreciate the opportunity very much. And, and thank you all uh, for giving me an opportunity to talk a little bit about Leading Age Florida. I, as it turns out, I didn't expect to do this, but I'm going to talk maybe as much about FLAGRA as I, as I will about Leading Age Florida. And I, um, as I get into that, it's worth noting that um, I mentioned to your leadership this morning, I do calls with my colleagues from around the country, from the other states around the country, quarterly. And on those calls, someone is always complaining about their relationship with their residence association. Somebody from another state, always. They aren't always excellent partnerships. Florida sets the standard for the rest of the country in terms of the partnership we have with our uh, flag work organization. Bennett Napier is a close friend of mine and an excellent colleague. And when I get to the legislative update, I'll mention um, one of the many ways that that is so important. Um, and, and one of the reasons I think we've been so successful uh, collaboratively on legislation. But first, let me introduce myself just a little bit. Uh, I could dive right into the policy stuff, but um, maybe something about me before I go too far. Um, unlike the folks who just spoke, I am not originally from Pinellas County. I'm originally from Laramie County, Wyoming. Um, so I'm the one person you know from Wyoming. Uh, if, you, uh, if you get a call and you have a 307 area code on your cell phone, it's likely to be me. You know someone from Wyoming? You do? Good, all right. There's about half a million of us, so the odds are that you'll know someone eventually. But uh, my family and I have, I have six children, and uh, we moved out here almost six years ago now. And, and it doesn't really, the first question is why, you know, people from Florida tend to say, why would you leave Wyoming? It's wide open, the weather's perfect, there are no people, there's no crime, there's no smog, there's no traffic. There was 31 inches of snow in my hometown last weekend. <laughs> so that's why I live in Florida. And... Uh, and I am, I'm never shoveling a sidewalk again as long as I live. I, I'm sure you can understand. Um, so very happy to be here. I came here to do this work. My grandmother was a Presbyterian minister. She was actually the first woman ordained Presbyterian minister in the history of Wyoming, a little bit of a pioneer. And she died in a nursing home in Wyoming with Alzheimer's. Um, and it was, not a, it was not a terrific experience. It was, it, was a, it was a horrific experience. And I remember thinking, we can do better than that and I want to be part of the solution. So I ran a consulting company out there. I represented Leading Age Wyoming, if you can imagine. All 38 Wyoming nursing homes were members. Uh, we have 700 nursing homes in Florida. Uh, and look forward to the opportunity to come here, live in this paradise that we all get to live in and do this work on your behalf and with partners like, like Brandt and, and Regency Oak. So just a little background. Is it okay? I know we're broadcasting this, but it's okay if I move around just a little bit? Oh, no, I move with you. You will? Okay. I, I come from a family of preachers. Standing still is going to be hard for me to do. Um, just a little bit of background on Leading Age Florida. So we are in our 58th year. Uh, we were originally founded uh, to represent largely nonprofit providers of aging services, mostly nursing homes at the time. In that 58 years, things have changed just a little bit. Now, we are the only association in Florida that represents the entire continuum of care for aging services. So we represent affordable housing for low-income seniors. And that's, we have a lot of that actually in the St. Pete area, but, but South Florida especially. Uh, assisted living providers, nursing homes, and then of course CCRCs. We're the only association in Florida that represents CCRCs or life plan communities. And uh, I noticed in the video, which I love by the way, uh, well done video, uh, there are 71 CCRCs in Florida today, and 64 of them are members of Leading Age Florida. So we don't quite have the market cornered, but we're not done. We will get the market cornered before it's all over. Um, and our mission, is, as Brandt said, it's really very straightforward. Advocate, educate, serve. And I'll get to the advocate part in just a moment. We'll talk a little bit about the legislature before I wrap up. 
Um, education is continuing education, ongoing professional development. But it's the serve part that I think I want to spend a moment talking about this morning. Um, and that's because uh, part of the invitation for me to come speak today is just say a little bit about what you've been doing. Current events, current happenings at Leading Age Florida. Well, the things that we've been doing at Leading Age Florida are almost exactly the same thing that you've been doing for the last 12 months. It's been all COVID all the time, as you can imagine. I was on a plane to D.C. in, oh, get a little feedback. Uh, I was on a plane to D.C. in February of last year, and we had just started hearing rumblings about this virus in China. And my vice president of public policy said to me, I'm not so sure I feel good about getting on an airplane. And I said, ah, yeah, China, we're, we're okay, right? We, many of us were there a year ago. This isn't going to be a big deal. It'll be a few weeks. Pretty much all we've done for the last 12 months, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, is serve. And, and serve our members in dealing with COVID-19. So just as some examples, we started doing daily phone calls. We have about 250 members total. Uh, all across all those categories that I mentioned. But because many of them are like Regency Oaks where there are multiple levels of care on a single campus, we actually represent about 500 buildings. We started last March doing phone calls for all of our members seven days a week. So we'd have 500 or 1,000 people on the phone every day of the week dealing with the changing regulations, the changing federal or, uh, uh, orders and directives. Of course, the state orders and directives changed almost daily. Uh, we have this example, it's hard to believe now, uh, but there was a CMS uh, order, a regulation that came out last spring. It changed six times in three weeks. So all the folks who work at Regency Oaks who were doing everything they could to prevent the virus from getting in, to prevent the spread and that sort of thing, were dealing in an environment where the rules literally changed day to day. So we've done over 170 of those phone calls now. We did them seven days a week. We started out, it was so rudimentary when we started, it was just a conference call, and we couldn't mute everyone. So you all remember the Supreme Court hearing from last spring when we heard one of the justices' toilet flush in the background. Uh, we had that. We had a woman chasing her dog around in the backyard, yelling at him, or trying to explain CMS regulations and that sort of thing. Uh, but, but hundreds of those calls now to try to make sure that our members had all the information they need to try to help interpret uh, all of the flood of information that was coming out. There have been over 350 sets of, of direction, directives, orders, regulations, guidance at the federal and state level that our members have, have had to try to balance and figure out how to deal with in the last year. So it's, um, it's been an enormous undertaking. Um, the good news is, and I sometimes wonder, I, I look at Brandt and I look at his team, and I, you know, the, they are the people who have been doing the work for the last 12 months. My team and I sit in an office in Tallahassee and push paper around. You know, we, we try to interpret regulation and we try to make sure we understand what the latest information is and make sure our members have it. But we weren't on the ground taking care of residents. We weren't the ones implementing the, the, the challenging kind of rules and regulations that they had to implement. Um, but I think every minute that we were able to help save our members not digging through paperwork from the federal government is a minute they were able to spend serving you. And in that way, uh, I think we've been able to provide some service. We think, of, we think of the pandemic in four phases. First, there was the PPE phase. We all remember the PPE phase when global supply chains were choked. You couldn't get PPE. We had members whose masks and gowns were hand-sewn masks, shower caps, and trash bags. And they sent us pictures of, of their, their uh, clinical staff trying to serve residents literally gowned in trash bags. It was that bad. We finally got through PPE, as you all remember, and then we went to the testing phase. Everybody remembers the testing phase. I know you do. We heard from some of you. Uh, you couldn't get testing either. And of course, it was a really bumpy rollout. It was slow. When you could get testing, we weren't sure we could trust the results, if you could get testing at all. Remember the days I've been telling the legislature for a month now, it's hard now for the, for the general public to remember how little we knew 12 months ago. <laughs> remember when you would get a PCR test and it would take 14 days to get your results back? And by then you're out of the gestation period of the virus anyway, so the test didn't really matter. We did that for several months. Um, then we went into the visitation phase. And I know you all know about the visitation phase where the, uh, our member buildings were locked down with good reason. It was a difficult decision, but with good reason, uh, visitation was prevented. I was just having a conversation with your leadership this morning. Visitation's open again, right? We're phasing back in and doing it in as smart and as reasonable and safe a way as we can. But how wonderful is that? 
that people are able to come back on campus and visit with you and you can visit with your family members. I, uh, the amount of time we spent watching visits, you know, people visiting through Windows um, via FaceTime. Who here is a FaceTime expert, by the way? That, yeah, I thought there would be a few. We're all good at Zoom now, right? Twelve months ago, we hadn't heard of Zoom, and now that's all we do. We do Zoom. I actually Zoomed with Brent a few weeks ago. And, and, and then we got into the vaccine phase. And, and this is the real light at the end of the tunnel. And so we've been managing with our members all the way through. We were able to uh, help get vaccines out to places where they, they weren't arriving. We were able to help work with CVS and Walgreens and CDR and the National Guard strike teams and the governor's office and everybody else to try to get vaccines out to, uh, to people who desperately needed them. And I understand you're all vaccinated. The vaccine process here went very smoothly and, and uh, what a blessing it is to know that we, we've got the, the vaccine on board and we can start moving back into life as normal. I'm not fully vaccinated. I got my first shot last Friday in Tallahassee and I woke up, you'll all be able to relate to this. I woke up on Saturday morning and I thought, God, what did I do? I did. <laughs> <laughs> Clearly I don't exercise. I didn't do anything that would have caused my shoulder to be sore. It was that dang shot. So anyway, the vaccine is the light at the end of the tunnel. We are still helping members with vaccines. I don't think you have those challenges except the population isn't static, right? There are new staff members, there are new residents, there are new folks across the campus coming in, so we're still working on solutions for that. But my goodness, what, what a year. What an incredible 12 months, and what an opportunity for us, uh, I think, as my grandmother taught me, just be of service. Just be of service. And what an incredible opportunity for us to do that. Um, we are looking forward now. Uh, post-pandemic, and so we're working with Flycra on what will the new world look like. Of all the things we did and all the things we learned and dealt with in the last 12 months, some of that's going to stay, probably. So what components of that will stay with us into the future? What components will go away? Um, I, I'm afraid to say, but I think Zoom is probably with us to stay, although it was nice to get in my car and drive out of Tallahassee yesterday. Um, it's also nice to be able to do meetings with people across the country via Zoom. I think some of those things probably won't go away. But we're working with Flight on some education and some opportunities to help our members see around the corner just a little bit and understand how the, the environment uh, may have been permanently changed as a result of COVID and, and for the better, we hope. So let me uh, dive into our legislative work very quickly and then I'll stop and see if we have any questions. Our legislative work is probably the area where we spend the most time working with FLICRA, and our number one priority is a shared priority that FLICRA has helped us with a lot. In fact, you may have seen a few weeks ago, there was an opinion piece in the Tampa Bay Times about COVID-related liability protections for long-term care providers, and it was co-written by yours truly and Bennett Napier from FLICRA. So we work together a lot on legislative issues. FLICRA has been very supportive on our top priority, which is the COVID liability uh, protection bill. I'm happy to report, I know that you're all up on the news, but I'm happy to report that the Senate passed our liability bill last week, last Thursday, I think, uh, and now the bill goes to the House, which we expect will pass on Thursday or Friday of this week, and that will go to the governor's office. So we think we're just about there in terms of getting thoughtful, reasonable, measured COVID liability protections in place for providers. And all the context I just described about the environment that Regency Oaks and others have been operating in for the last 12 months, those are the reasons that liability protection are so important from our perspective. Um, it, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't a practical impossibility. It was an actual impossibility to, uh, to follow all the guidelines simultaneously. Think about that. The federal government says you have to do things this way. The state government says, no, you have to do them this way. And your folks have to figure out which of those will we follow and what penalty are we willing to accept if we get written up for doing it the wrong way. We have a terrific example in front of us right now. You, you are all aware, of course, that visitation began opening up in Florida in September of last year, although, again, it's been a slow process. Two weeks ago, CMS issued new guidelines for visitation. The guidelines from CMS are different from the state's order about visitation. So we're either following what CMS said or we're following what the state said, but in either case, we're out of compliance. So that's really been the nature of the environment for the last year. So we see this liability protection from two perspectives. First of all, it's, it's what providers need so that they can continue doing the work that they need to do in this ever-changing, difficult environment uh, without 
worrying about what often are, I know I maybe, I should have surveyed everybody for their political affiliations before I got into this, uh, and your, and your uh, professional backgrounds, because I may get into a little hot water here, but, uh, but we already know there are over 100 lawsuits that have been filed against providers in Florida. That number jumps by about 10 to 15 lawsuits a week, and many of those are opportunistic. They're, they're sue and settle, right? You know how that works. They, you file a lawsuit against a provider, you make, a spend a lo- make them spend a lot of money defending it, and then after they've spent all that money, you sue and the case go- I mean, sorry, you settle and the case goes away. And everybody has a right to sue, and this bill won't prevent anybody from having the opportunity to sue. One of the things, I learned this from a mentor of mine in Washington, D.C. at Leading Age National a few years ago. At Leading Age, we believe in two kind of providers, the good and the gone. <laughs> It's that simple. There is no excuse for providing substandard subpar care for residents in Florida or anywhere else in the country. So we've never been in a position of, of trying to prevent providers who should be sued for being negligent from, at, from being sued. We've never been in a position to, to try to prevent residents from having that right. What we do want to prevent is those sue and settle opportunistic lawsuits that will drive up fees for you which is where we uh, uh, met, that's the nexus between us and FlyCorp. We have this shared and now kind of obvious understanding. Without residents, there are no CCRCs. And if there are no CCRCs, where will the residents go? And so Bennett and I work on political issues from that perspective all the time. Uh, and, and this was an easy opportunity for us to say, look, if we can prevent the system from being clogged with unnecessary opportunistic lawsuits, we can also prevent the trickle-down effect of those lawsuits from, from getting to all of you. So uh, we think it's a good bill. We think it's reasonable and thoughtful. We think it provides the right kind of protections that, that the leadership in your community needs so they can keep serving you. And it protects residents' right to sue if, if there's a provider who's been truly negligent. So we'll keep our fingers crossed. I, I'm, I'm on the road visiting your sister communities all this week, so I expect the bill will pass in the House while I'm on the road. Nevertheless, through the magic of modern technology, you will see a press release go out for me on Thursday, um, thanking the House for their support and urging the governor to, uh, uh, to go ahead and sign that bill. One last item on the legislative front, and then I'll stop and see if there are questions or, or issues you'd like to talk about. Um, you may have heard of a program. It's called the Personal, Personal Care Attendant Program. Um, as you know, especially last spring and summer at the, at the peak of the pandemic, Uh, it was difficult for for our provider members to get staff. Some staff left and didn't come back because they were afraid of working in conditions where they might get the virus. Some staff did get the virus and couldn't come back. And then, of course, because of the context of all that, it was difficult to recruit and retain new folks. So in the midst of all of that, we created a new program, this personal care attendant program, and it's basically, if you think about it as a support role for a certified nursing assistant, It's a way for folks to get into the pipeline. It's a career path so that we can go out and hire people and get them into long-term care as a career opportunity um, to learn what it's like to to be a CNA and to serve seniors in that environment and to help out with kind of the lower-level tasks, making beds, picking up food trays, those kinds of things. So the clinical work will still be done by the people who are clinically trained, but this is a way for us to get some support for those folks, try to remove some of that burden, uh, and, and help them out so that they have more time to spend delivering uh, clinical care and dealing with that part of their work. So th- as with everything, the liability bill has been taking a shellacking. There are groups out there who think we're trying to upend the system and, and uh, that it's the worst thing that's ever happened in the Florida legislature. There are groups out there who think this PCA bill uh, is similarly detrimental. Uh, but the truth is we think it's an opportunity to create a career path, to get some people some experience, and to support the staff that's been doing such an, an excellent job here and at other communities across the state. So that's our PCA bill. Um, it is flying through the legislature, which is good news. And uh, hopefully in the next couple of weeks, we'll have that program in place. That makes it permanent. And then we can really start recruiting these folks and getting them into the pipeline and, and getting their help. So probably a little bit into the policy weeds. Uh, so I apologize for that if that's the case. But those are really our, our two biggest issues. Everything else is about the budget, and this is the beginning of week four of the legislature, so they'll really start getting into budget issues and Medicaid and all kinds of things down the road. Happy to talk about the budget and Medicaid if that's something that you're interested in hearing about. But I think what I'll do is stop there and see if there are questions or concerns 
um, other issues you'd like to talk about that I can address while I'm here. Um, sure. What about the bed tax? Hold on just one second. Oh, sorry about that. I got ahead of us. This way we'll uh, capture it on the TV. Uh, what about the bed tax? Do you think that's going to stay dead? Or is that going to, well, but you know of anything that's being discussed about it? Or that, that's a great question. Thank you for that. So, so, so CCRCs in Florida are exempt from the bed tax, as you know, so it doesn't apply here. Um, last year, there was an effort in Congress, actually. This all ties together. Thank you for the segue. Uh, there was an effort in Congress last year to eliminate that exemption, which would make CCRC subject to the bed tax. Bless you. Um, that's, actually, <coughs> that's actually the flight I was on last February when we started hearing about COVID. We went to Congress, uh, and specifically the members of the Florida delegation, and we said, you understand this means hundreds of thousands, in some cases millions of dollars in new taxes for senior living providers in Florida if this exemption goes away. We managed to get every member of the Florida congressional delegation to sign on to uh, our opposition. Uh, and late last, well, actually I think it was in January of this year, CMS has finally once and for all said that discussion is off the table. So it's over, uh, that exemption remains, and we don't hear any discussion in the Florida legislature about trying to do anything with that. Thank you. That's really good news. Yeah, yeah, thank you. And, and I should say, I mean, I, I, I don't mean to overdo this, but I think it's important to make sure we, we share credit where credit is due, and, and Flycro was a significant uh, element. We, we sent out messages to our member communities, and we said, look, I suspect your residents won't be excited to pay a million dollars in new taxes or fees associated with new taxes. And we had thousands of letters from Flycro member residents that got sent to Congress as well. We, so we didn't do it alone, but it is done, and that, that is good news. Thanks for the question. Other questions? All right. Pretty good video, what do you think? I think the Flyker video is excellent. It's excellent. I've already uh, emailed Bennett about that. I hope it helps with new recruits. And uh, if you have a chance, though, visit leadinghflorida.org. Uh, we have some good videos up there, uh, some good resources. <laughs> Uh, our convention is coming up this summer, and, and that's the opportunity we have to recognize our members who have really gone above and beyond and done outstanding work. So if you, if you go visit our website, you'll see uh, videos where we, we in, in very much similar fashion, recognize uh, clinical providers, leadership, uh, residents, and volunteers, and others who have just really done outstanding work. So I'd encourage you to visit leadinghflorida.org, and um, if there aren't other questions, Please don't hesitate to track me down if there's anything you need. If we can be of service in any way, uh, uh, or send Bennett after me. He knows where to get me, and we talk often. So thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. I appreciate it. All right, Steve, thank you so much. We truly appreciate you being here and uh, all the efforts that uh, you've uh, lent your hand with uh, over this past year. Uh, there was a time back when we were trying to get the uh, vaccine clinic scheduled that I just was losing my mind and uh, placed a phone call after a couple of uh, uh, more stressful emails than what they needed to be and, and uh, literally uh, he walked me off the, uh, the edge and was instrumental in helping us get this accomplished. So uh, it wouldn't have happened without your support and thank you so much for, for your efforts there. And uh, that's it for today. Thank you so much for running a few minutes over, and uh, go and have a great day. Thanks.